Good morning. Welcome to the online ministry of Pidcoke United Methodist Church. Pidcoke UMC is located about halfway between Coppers Cove and Gatesville on FM 116. We're currently conducting on-site services at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning in the pavilion outside our fellowship hall. On November 1st, we'll be moving back inside our sanctuary. We've come up with a way to uh, purify the air and to do some other things so we can minimize any risk to anyone inside, including distancing, wearing masks, those sorts of things. So starting November the 1st, we'll be back inside our sanctuary, meeting again at 10 o'clock, which is our regular worship time. So next Sunday morning, we'll be meeting at 10 o'clock inside the sanctuary. We'll be entering through the back entrance by the fellowship hall, not through the main entrance to the sanctuary. We'll have signs up to show you where to go. So please, if you'd like to be with us, join us for our services in our, in our sanctuary. Come be with us on Sunday, November the 1st at 10 o'clock. Now, before we begin our time together this morning, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we do thank you this morning. Uh, we always come to you with thanksgiving because, Lord, there's so much for us to be thankful for. Uh, we're thankful for the cooler temperatures. We're thankful for the rain that's come with the front. We're thankful for all of the things that you've given us. Uh, but Father, we're most thankful for your grace that no matter what happens around us in this world, no matter uh, what, what occurs, your grace is still there. Your grace still works and moves in and through us. Uh, your grace protects us. Your grace strengthens us. Your grace gives us peace and courage and comfort. So Lord, we're thankful for that grace this morning. And Lord, we just want to say we love you because of all, of you, all that you've done for us, all the blessings and all the gifts. So, Father, as we go through this time of, of looking into your word this morning, may your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. Father, may we be, uh, may we be strengthened in the things that we see and the things that we hear. And, Father, may our hearts be turned to, to you uh, with a love that we've not known before, with a love, Father, that exceeds all the love that we have for everything else in the world, simply the love of the Father. And we'll give you grace and glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen. At the west edge of the Grand Canyon, there is a structure that's a, a horseshoe-shaped glass walkway that sticks out some 70 feet over the rim of the Grand Canyon. It's not in the National Park. It's on the west side of the canyon, bordering uh, the Native American Reservation that's there. It's actually owned by, by the Native American tribe. I won't even try to pronounce their name uh, that, that owns that property. It was built at a cost of some $30 million dollars. Uh, through the efforts of a Chinese-American businessman. But I want to give you a little bit of a hint about how this thing is built. It's a, as I said, it's a horseshoe-shaped walkway with a clear glass floor. <clears throat> it extends 70 feet out over the canyon and gives an unobstructed view for almost 2,000 feet straight down. Now, this skywalk is supported by two 32-inch by 72-inch bridge beams that undergird it. That, that, those beams <clears throat> are supported by eight 32 by 32 inch box posts, four of, four of them on each side attached to the visitor center where the, where the bridge is. This is called the Grand Canyon Skywalk. Those, four, those eight posts are anchored into pair, in pairs into four large concrete footings that in turn are anchored into the bedrock by 96 two and a half inch diameter <clears throat> high-strength steel threaded rod bolts that are anchored 46 feet deep into the bedrock. The skywalk literally hangs on those supports suspended over the Grand Canyon. Now, keep that in mind. Uh, if you're where you can, Google the Grand Canyon skywalk and you can see what I'm talking about if you're not familiar with it. But now let's begin with, I want to I read a passage of scripture for you. This is found in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question. This is Jesus he's talking about. To test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. A large question arises in our world today, 
especially here in the United States, is we're just just days away uh, from the, the 2020 presidential election and our other general elections. What's most important for us as Christians? What is the one thing that we should be focused on? Now, there's all sorts of opinions out there, and I'm not even going to begin, begin to get into those because as surely as I do, I'll begin to get all sorts of angry comments and everything else, and that's not my point here this morning. My point is we as Christians need to be focused on the right things. Jesus in his, was in the situation. He was in the temple and he'd, he'd been approached by the Sadducees. The Sadducees had asked him a question about the resurrection, trying to trip him up in his theology because they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in spirits. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in miracles. Jesus had silenced them with his answer. Now the Pharisees who were opposed to the Sadducees because they did believe in all of those things, they were like, wow, this is pretty good. We like this. But they weren't satisfied with Jesus either. And one of their number, an expert in the law, that's what a lawyer is, <clears throat> this expert in the law came to Jesus to ask him a question to put him to the test, Matthew tells us. And his question is simply this. <clears throat> Which is the great commandment in the law? In other words, what's the most important commandment in the law? Now, Jesus came back with an answer, a very quick answer. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. He takes that, takes that directly from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. That, those words are repeated at the beginning of every synagogue service and have been for thousands of years because the Jews see that, and see that as the most important thing for them to do. Now, keep in mind that their concept of love is not a concept of emotion. It's not a concept of sentiment. It's love demonstrated in obedience, obedience to the law. Whereas the emphasis there, and even among some Christians, is on, uh, is on obedience to the law in a strictly legalistic sense. The concept is still there. If we love God, we'll obey God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 14, and verse 15, he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So you see, this concept is consistent, consistent with, with Christian teaching. And yet, <clears throat> Jesus didn't stop there. Now, I dare say that very few of us would argue, just like the Pharisee would not argue with, with Jesus' pronouncement. Here's the most important commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Nobody can argue with that. As we say sometimes, that's like trying to argue with apple pie and motherhood. We, it's, it's important. We know it's important. It's exactly the right thing. But then Jesus follows that up with another commandment. He says, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I'm sure this Pharisee lawyer was like, wait, wait, what? I didn't, I didn't ask anything about a second commandment. But you see, here's where obedience begins to come into play. The second commandment is how we put into practice that obedience to God. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. A direct quote from Deuteronomy, excuse me, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. Now, if you go back and look at that verse in its context, what you find is there's... God is, given, is giving the Israelites through Moses, is giving them some commands here about how they interact with other people. He talks about justice, fairness, care for those who have needs, holding those, even those who are aliens among them, with honor and respect. You love your neighbor, he said, as yourself. You don't do anything to hurt them. You love them just like you loved yourself. And then God answers that question. And he nails that down. He said, I am the Lord. Now, Jesus said, he used a very interesting phraseology right here. He said, on these two depend all the law and the prophets. Now, the word for depend there comes from a Greek word that literally means, in this context, means to depend on in the sense of a door that hangs on a hinge, depends on a hinge. Many of our modern translations keep that same language out of the King James. We read what we read in the King James and many of our modern translations keep that. 
they, the idea of the visual image of a door that hangs on a hinge, it depends on a hinge. This idea of two commandments being bonded together in that sense, our love for God and our love for our neighbor come together. We're not truly obedient to God in loving God if we're not also loving our neighbor. That's what Jesus is saying to us. Just as surely as the Grand Canyon Sky Bridge hangs on all those massive steel structures and on those bolts that go almost 50 feet deep into the bedrock to hold it in place, just as certainly our service, our obedience, our relationship with God hangs on these two commandments. Love the Lord God supremely. Love our neighbor as ourself. We don't have a lot of trouble understanding what it means to love God supremely, even though we do have a lot of trouble doing it. But as we do that, we understand what we, we have a very clear picture of what that means to us. But what about this business of loving the neighbor? In Luke's gospel, as Luke gives this account, he uses this, this same interchange between Jesus and the lawyer to introduce the story of the Good Samaritan. And I'm not going to bring that to you this morning because that's not my point. But simply to say that the lawyer in that story wanting to justify himself, Luke said, said, who is my neighbor? And you see, there's the sticking point. We always wonder, who is our neighbor? Is it the fellow down the street? Oh, no, it can't be him. He's a jerk. Is it the neighbor next door? No, they're not like me. They have a different religion. They have, you know, they practice different things than, than I practice. Is it the person that we see who mows our yard, who may, have to, who may have a Spanish accent? Who is our neighbor? Is it people who are just people that are like us? The Jewish rabbis by Jesus' time had narrowed the definition of neighbor down to the point where it only included their fellow Jews. No one else could be counted as a neighbor, and yet God had clearly told them in that same passage where Jesus quoted in, in, in Leviticus chapter 19 that they were to honor and respect the, the aliens among them, that they were to be just and right in all their dealings with with others. They were to care for those who had need, for the widows, for the orphans, for the others who were hurting among them. So what does it mean to love our neighbor? It means very simply, in this context, it means very simply that we love them just like we love ourselves. Now when we look at self-love, what we look at is an instinct that God has built into every one of us that says we'll do whatever we need to do in order to sustain ourselves, in order to survive. And when we say we're going, to, we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves, we're saying we're going to help our neighbor survive. We're going to do the things for them that we wouldn't want them to do for us if we were in need. We're going to be kind to them. We're going to treat them justly. We're going to treat them fairly. We're going to help them meet their needs to the degree that they, that they have needs and we're capable of doing that. Love the Lord your God supremely. Love your neighbor as yourself. So what's important for us to do as Christians today? I think it comes down to that one, those two things that are married to each other. That, and everything else we have, every other principle that we have as Christians, every other thing that we say is valuable to us, the sanctity of human life, the, uh, the, the morality of our society, both of which are threatened by the two ends of our political spectrum today, by the way, all those things hinge on this, on loving God supremely and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. Let me try to illustrate that for you, if I may. In 1987, there was a movie released called The Princess Bride. If you have a daughter who's like in her late 30s, early 40s, like mine was, she, mine was about eight or nine years old at the time, I, that was her favorite movie. It was the story of a peasant girl named Buttercup and her, her youthful love called Wesley. Buttercup was, and Wesley were deeply in love with each other and they would constantly be out together and doing things together. And whatever Buttercup would ask Wesley, whatever she asked him for, his response would always be, as you wish. Wesley would give Buttercup anything that she asked for that was within his power to give her. Now, I won't go through the whole movie because it would take too long, but if you know the story, but at the end of the movie, 
as the story is concluded, as the, the grandfather is telling this story or reading this story to his grandson, the grandfather played by Peter Falk, the late Peter Falk, and the grandson played by Fred Savage, the grandfather who's been estranged from his family is leaving. And the, the grandson says, will you come back and finish the story? And the grandfather's touching response is as you wish. Our relationship with God is a relationship in which as God speaks to us to love Him supremely in that love, His one command, His most important command to us after that is love your neighbor as yourself. And our response, I believe, should be that same as you wish. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you've loved us supremely. And you give us the privilege to love you supremely. But you also give us the privilege to love our neighbors, to love those around us, to love those who are in need, to love those who are not in need. Father, just to love our neighbors just like we love ourselves. May our response to your command be simply as you wish. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I want to thank you for being with us this morning. I hope this has been a blessing to you. May God bless you, give you a wonderful day, and thanks again for being with us.